is coming to you live from warm and sunny Florida, where more than 100,000 fans have flocked to the Daytona International Speedway for the 18th running of the Daytona 500, the richest stock car race in the history of the sport. 42 of these high-powered machines will be moving out on the parade lap. The command to start their engines has been given, and when the green flag drops, it'll be 200 laps, 500 grueling miles over this famous high-bank trioval at top speeds in excess of 200 miles an hour for an approximate purse of $350,000. This ABC Sports exclusive is brought to you by the Miller Brewing Company, brewers of Miller High Life. If you've got the time, we've got the beer. And by Gabriel Shock Absorbers. No matter what you drive, no matter how you drive, there's a Gabriel Shock for you. Gabriel, king of the road. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Bill Fleming, welcoming you to what we hope to be one of the most exciting automobile races of the sports year. The reason we say that is because we have a field today of proven champions. People like Richard Petty, David Pearson, A.J. Foyt, Bobby Allison, Cale Yarborough, Buddy Baker, and, of course, the defending champion of this race, Benny Parsons. We also have some young chargers out there, Dave Marcus and Darrell Waltrip. And we have one of the most unusual front rows in the history of the 500 here. On the pole, car number 83 is Remo Scott, a former corn farmer from Keokuk, Iowa, a good driver in the USAC stock car circuit. And next to him, car number 81, driven by a rookie, a former truck driver from Davenport, Iowa, Terry Ryan. To explain how they got there and some of the ramifications of this week, let's call in our expert of today, world driving champion, Jackie Stewart. Well, thank you, Bill. Great to be at the tour on a beautiful sunny day. I think the story, of course, the front row of the grid, well, it is different because Ramo and his partner there in the front row got there because of the disallowed times in qualifying last Sunday. The fastest three times were disallowed and put further back in the grid. But the two in the front, after all, were still fourth and fifth, which are very creditable times, particularly in the company that you see here. But I have to think, being a race driver in this being the biggest of them all here at Daytona, that people like Richard Petty and David Pearson are going to be awful close when the time comes. All right, now we mentioned Ramo Stott and Terry Ryan. A little bit earlier, our expert in the pit area, Chris Economaki, had a chance to talk to these two front runners today. These are the strange faces on the front row for today's Daytona 500, the Hurry and Hawkeyes, Ramo Stott and Terry Ryan. Congratulations, fellas, on your performance, but the NASCAR regulars say you're not going to stay there very long. Raymond, what do you say to that? Well, uh, we're there uh, to start. I uh, hope to make uh, a full lap in front of them, and uh, uh, I know uh, Dave Marcus is right behind me, and uh, David Pearson and all the great NASCAR drivers are right there. Terry Ryan's along the side of me, and when we come down for that flag, I just hope that we could carry him through. Terry, are you going to work with your fellow Iowan and uh, sort of hold the boys back? Well, I don't know about holding them back, Chris, or not, but we're definitely going to do our best. Our, our best to stay up front there and run, and uh, I was having a little difficulty catching on to the draft the first of the week. I worked very hard along with Ramos' help at it and the help of some other great guy national drivers. And uh, if uh, our car works as well as it did through the second 125 qualifying race, we're definitely going to be there all day long, bar any trouble. Good luck to you both. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much, Chris. And as the Goodyear blimp shows you this live picture from the Daytona International Speedway, you can see the 42 cars strung out behind the pace car. This is the parade lap. The pace lap will be coming up next. Now let's take a look at the course itself, and I think we can get a beautiful view of it, Jackie Stewart, from the blimp today. Yes, big long view of all the cars parked in the infield there. You're looking at a really strong area of view. You can see the cars in the top hand side of your picture there, top left hand side getting round there and getting round the track. This is a big race track. It's 650 acres. The track itself is a two and a half mile trial. It holds in seats 69,000 people. There's a total crowd here, well, about 120,000 that can hold. You can see it is a trioval there with a the kink you just see there, the dog leg, as they come down into turn one, and that's where you can see the cars right now. You can see the pace car leading in the center. Turn one, of course, one of the fastest corners. The drivers here don't take their feet off the accelerator all the way around. You can see it's really one big turn. They call it turn one and they call it turn two, but really it's one big, long corner. 13 degrees, uh, 31 degrees of banking on that corner. You can see the shadow there as the cars go around. These cars going around there at speeds of up to 180 miles an hour. They qualified at about 183, but the fastest car is doing about 185. The back stretch, what you're looking at right now, is 3,000 feet in length, and this is where the highest speeds are gained because they slingshot down there. They draft, or slipstream, as we call them in Europe, and this is a way of gaining speed. The car behind allows the car in front 
to uh, to break up that wind and therefore allow the cars to go faster. Okay, so turn three is another one, another fast one. Turn three and turn four almost linked together as they go around there. And again, this is a place where they're setting up for coming out of turn four for getting to the start finishing line. And of course, this is a bumpy corner sort of place where you can get into trouble. There are the cars. And a bit of a dog leg as they come down the home stretch. Now as the cars go into turn three, Ramos start and Terry Ryan. That'll be on the front row. Then Dave Marcus in 71, Walter in 88, Buddy Baker in 15, Petty in 43. And then as we come by, we've got Pearson in 21 and Allison in 2. In 14, we've got Cuckoo Marlin, Richard Brooks in 90 next to him. Lenny Pond in 52, Earl Ross in uh, 54, Neil Bonnet in 12, Gail Yarborough in 11. Jimmy Herdeby is in 95, David Hobson 73, C. Scorch in 24, Walt Ballard in 30. And as they come in, the pace car is in. We're going to get a green flag. The green flag is out, and Raymond Scott on the pole. The white car really stands on it. Terry Ryan next to him. Dave Marcus in the red car right behind. And next to him is Walter. And take a look at Buddy Baker trying to slide down on the inside. That's the white car currently in fifth place on the inside. But it's Raymond Scott still in the lead as they go into turn two. Next to him is Terry Ryan, the truck driver from Davenport, Iowa. The one thing they really want to do today is to hang on to that lead for the first lap as they flash down that back stretch. The car is strung out a bit, and it is Remo Stott still trying to hang on the lead, but Buddy Baker hits slid in there. Buddy Baker in car number 15. And right behind him is Richard Petty. Then Terry Ryan, then Remo Stott. So it's Buddy Baker who said, I've got a feeling today, maybe I can do it. Here he comes. A fellow who has never won the Daytona 500, coming off the best year he's ever had, 1975. As they swing by here, at the end of one lap, is Buddy Baker, Richard Petty. And I'm checking the course to see if everybody got started. Jackie, I believe all 42 cars are on the course. Yes, it's a clean start all the way through. And I think immediately you see these two superstars coming up there right through the field immediately. All right, A.J. Foyt started in 31st position today, and there he is right now. He said that he wanted to really go out there and not stay back in the back. He doesn't like it back there. Next to him, incidentally, in 32nd position, car number 72, Benny Parsons. He started there a year ago and won the race. That's how much A.J. has to go. As you see the front of the pack coming in at the end of two, it is Baker followed by Richard Petty and Darrell Waltrip. Yeah, car smoking there as he was coming round there, and back he's going to pull into the pit. So it was a car smoking badly, and he's pulled into all the Okay, that is Neil Bonnet, a rookie, car number 12. Neil Bonnet from Hueytown, Alabama, from the hometown of Bobby Allison. Another car coming by, but as we swing down the back stretch, we see that Buddy Baker and Richard Petty are hanging right in there, and there is A.J. Foyt. I'm trying to pick up now uh, how many positions A.J. may have picked up on the field. Look at him go, though. I'll tell you one thing about A.J., he knows exactly the groove on this track and where he wants to move. At the end of three laps, it's Buddy Baker in the lead, Richard Petty, and then Darrell Walter, Terry Ryan, David Pearson. And they're swinging by at better than 180 miles an hour. Back in just a moment. We are on lap number five. 195 laps to go, and can you believe that A.J. Floyd, who started in 31st position today, has already worked himself up to position number 13 on the race course. And a car smokes and they go into turn three over there, an engine has blown in the second group, and as the first group comes into the number four turn, they swing by car number 90, that is driven by Richard Brooks. At the end of five laps, in the lead right now is David Pearson in car number 21. David Pearson, who has never won the Daytona 500. That is a surprising fact, but neither he nor Buddy Allison nor Buddy Baker has never won this prestigious race. Although today we have former winners in the field, Richard Petty, Cale Yarborough, A.J. Floyd, and Betty Parsons. Down the back stretch, it's Buddy Baker now who has taken the lead over David Pearson, and Darrell Walter is still hanging in there in third, and now another pass as Pearson, and Walter gets a beautiful draft and goes right behind David Pearson, and that means that Baker falls into third place. Richard Petty, now fourth as they swing by 
at the end of six laps. Now Walter looks like he might try to make that move. That's the green and white car, number 88 on the inside, right alongside David Pearson. Buddy Baker in that grass, in the slipstream, gets the added horsepower of the car ahead of him, and he slides by David Pearson. Now, it may look like David Pearson slowed down a bit there, but when you combine the horsepower of two cars, you get nearly 1,100 horsepower swinging through there. Well, one of the things David Pearson's obviously waiting for, he was coming off of uh, turn two right now and going down the back, should be seen Buddy Baker in 15, the white car getting past Darrell Walter in the 88 car. So there he goes, Buddy Baker, a big man, a big, big man, six foot six inches high, a big strong man, a detonant really, because this is where he's done a lot of his work, he's always local here. He's a boy out of Charlotte, North Carolina, whose daddy, Buck Baker, was one of the great pioneers of stock car racing in America. All right, at the end of seven laps, it's Buddy Baker in the lead. And right behind is Daryl Walter, car number 88. I'll tell you one thing about Daryl Walter. He won one of the qualifying 125s here in a that uh, Gatorade Chevy. A lot of people said if you want to pick a long shot for today's race, pick Walter. Uh, native born in Kentucky and who now lives in Tennessee. So there goes Walter into the lead as he swings by Buddy Baker. We'll be back in just a moment. Well, the biggest guy in this field who looks like he should be a defensive tackle on a football team, Buddy Baker has the lead and he's followed very closely by Darrell Walter, cars number 15 and 88. Buddy Baker started in the number five position. It was a bad accident, not a bad one, but a spinning car down this front uh, straightaway, and he is just on the apron. Fortunately, he did not get onto the race course itself. And I'm trying to see the number of the car, Jackie, whether you can see yeah, it or not. Yeah, it's salt saltwater who spun down there. He came off of the dog leg, and you can see the yellow being thrown there. He did come off of the dog leg right in front of the main grandstands here. Spun right down there. Doesn't look as if he's hit very much indeed, but it is salt water. It is salt. The yeah. man who had the enormously big accident in Indianapolis a few years ago recovered from it, but he's sitting stationary at the moment. Salt water. Looked like he was going into a bad spin down this front straightaway. I don't know whether salt engine blew or whether somebody's ahead of his blew that threw oil on the track. Let's take a look at it. And there he goes, spinning all the way through there. You can see the car in front of him smoking in the right-hand side of the picture. has just gone out. Salt keeping the car out of trouble. Didn't hit any other vehicles. This is important to keep the car low in the speedway. Once you get off the ra racetrack, never to go back up in front of the other cars. Because remember, they're doing 180 miles an hour. And if you're T-boned by one of them, I'm afraid that's one of the few times when you could really have a fatal accident here in this very steep NASCAR circuit. So they're running under the yellow, and Salt Walters is now going back to the pit. Salt Walters going back there will obviously have to change his tyres because they'll have flat spots in the tyres. This means when the car has spun round, he's locked up the wheels, the tyres go flat where they've been strubbing against the road surface, and it means the tyre is no longer round. And of course, there's a strong vibration through the steering, the driver can't handle it, and that's what Salt Walter is now going back to the pits for. All right, and everybody else will be coming into the pits now. As they come in, it's Buddy Baker into the pits, Darrell Walter into the pits, Expect everybody, Pearson, all the cars are coming in to have a look at those tires, take on fuel. The last 10 laps have been completed by the leader. The yellow caution flag is still out on the course because of the spin of Salt Walter. Fortunately, nobody was hurt in that one. Salt continued on his way, and I thought he did a very nice job of getting it down on the infield. Had that car come back out onto the track with all the traffic behind him, you know what could happen. But there is the key to it. See that car smoking at the top of your screen? That's the car that blew, and that is the oil on the track. We have always been impressed with many of the safety features that NASCAR employs, the harnesses, the roll bars, the fire extinguishers, and before we got underway today, Jackie had a chance to look at one of these Grand National cars. There can be no better car to show you the safety than King Richard Petty's. As I move along, I'm coming in front of a, a mesh effect. Now, this here is fireproof. The idea is to stop a driver's head or arms being thrown out in the case of the car rolling over. To get into the car, he has to put that down because he can't get in the doors. The doors are welded up just in case they fly open as well. The first thing you see, obviously, is this seat, which is certainly different from the normal car. It's padded to keep the driver in the seat against the high banked ovals at high speeds, the G's that he gets, holds him in, particularly in the shoulder side here. Of course, the driver wears seat belts like every driver on the road should nowadays. He's got two shoulder straps, he's got a waist strap, and then he's got one that slips through between his legs. The reason for that? To stop something called submarining. 
when a driver on heavy impact can slide underneath his own seat belt and sometimes even get decapitated. That has happened. This certainly would stop that. Steering wheel, it's padded in the case of impact as well. It's got fire extinguishers on board, although the fire hazard is certainly minimized in the NASCAR by the fact that the, the tanks are sealed outside the survival cell that we're looking at right now. It's underneath the car and shouldn't get in. If a fire does occur, however, we've got two fire extinguishers independently operated by the driver or by a rescue crew who could come. They just pull the pin and the fire extinguisher goes off. Now, the roll over cage is the most important factor of all, and this has probably saved more life than anyone else. You see all of this cage in here, heavily padded again to stop the driver from coming into contact with his arms or his crash helmet to stop severe impact. But that roll over cage has certainly saved more lives than anything else I can think of in any category of racing in the world. On the windscreen as well, we should have a little look at the windscreen because here there are struts on this windscreen to stop anything heavy coming in. It's mandatory to have three, but Richard Petty, a man of safety, has four, so that he's not going to have anything come in there. There's a lot in safety in NASCAR. It's the safest type of motor racing that I know, and I would rather be in this car in an accident than any other I know. I saw one of the most spectacular accidents that I've ever seen in motor racing occur at this track last year in the Permatex 300. Red Farmer barrel rolled his car, how many times I don't know, down the front straightaway. The man escaped almost uninjured. He was at the racetrack the next day. How did that occur? It occurred because, first of all, the car is properly built, and when an accident occurs, NASCAR have now built in so many backup safety facilities that a driver really has a very strong possibility not only to live through an accident, but not be seriously injured. From my point of view, in all of my racing, I've never seen a safer form of motor racing than NASCAR. There are 10 trucks such as this spread around the 2.5 miles of this tri-oval. In each truck, there are two men, the driver and the operator. On this, on this truck are the safety equipment. Now, what is this? Spreader jacket. Now that, what happens in the case of an accident? Well, the idea is to get the man out. You use this slider in there to spread your metal apart. You might have to free a limb, a leg, caught between the clutch pedal, something like that. So you spread it apart with that. To get How does that operate? Uh, hydraulically with this jack. Okay, now these are the additional accessories along here for this. Now we've got more basic uh, essentials. We've got great crowbars here. We've even got an axe. In addition to that, you've got a fire extinguisher, a normal handheld fire extinguisher. But to supplement that, we have on the front end of the truck here a 350-pound powder fire extinguisher that is pressure-fed that will put a fire out, even a major fire, in a NASCAR vehicle in about 20 seconds. In addition to that, there are, of course, backup people as well. Quite a lot of equipment for emergency that might be needed in a big hurry. Here in Salt Walters pit. The crew can't get over the fact that Salt has not come in. His tires are probably flat spotted. They want to change the four tires. The car seems to be all right. He's restarted and back in line. Two stars, however, have gone out of this competition very early. Cale Yarborough and Dick Brooks, both of whom could have won the race. We'll be standing by when Salt does get in here. Back to you, Bill. Yeah, okay, uh, Chris, uh, on that uh, Cale Yarborough, car number 11, apparently they put a new engine in that car overnight, so it only well, it didn't even get out on the race course. Can you confirm that with us? Uh, they decided to change engine suppliers. They've been using a McLaren engine. They weren't happy with it in the qualifying round, and now they've gone to another maker. And uh, uh, just I, whether there was an engine on Cale's car that's silent or not, I do not know. I have not been down there. Okay, well, the, the official uh, word was that the engine blew, so... Unfortunately, he's out of the race, and we're taking a look at A.J. Foyt, who incidentally had moved his way up to 10th spot after starting in 31st. 14 laps have been completed. We've got a long way to go. So Walter has come into the pit area. He's getting the tire changes after that spin-up. I think Chris is with him. Oh, yes, Chris is going to make there. The inside rubber, whether or not they'll change the outside rubber this stop, no, they'll have that thing around. Perhaps then we'll be able to get a word with Salt Walter. The yellow is still out. They do not want to get a lap down. Okay, well, coming up next, ABC Sports continues its exclusive coverage of the 12th Winter Olympic Games by a satellite from Innsbruck, Austria, with a two-hour program, then again from Innsbruck at 5.30 Eastern and Pacific Time, 4.30 Central, and 7 o'clock Eastern and Pacific, 6 o'clock Central Time. And finally, we'll conclude our Olympic coverage with a two-hour program at, two at 9 o'clock Eastern and Pacific and at 8 o'clock Central Time. That will... Include, incidentally, the closing ceremonies. Always a beautiful thing to watch. So be sure to join us for this full day of Olympic action brought to you 
exclusively by ABC Sports. We're coming to you live from the Daytona International Speedway, a beautiful week of weather. This climax of Speed Week's here, and it looks like we're going to get a green flag. Car number 63, Terry Bivens, an unknown, really, from Shawnee Mission, Kansas, has the lead on the race course right now with Jackie Rogers behind him. That is due to the fact that the leaders, Moneymaker, Walton, and so forth, have come in for pit stops. Some of these other drivers choosing not to come in off the race course, but of course, uh, that will automatically catch up with them. On the 16th lap, and it says the average speed for the first 10 laps before the spin out was 179.283 miles per hour. We had a yellow on the ninth lap between 9 and 10. The green has come out on 16. And just to bring you up to date, Cale Yarbrough is out of the race, as is Richard Brooks. Neil Bonnet was out for a long time in the pits, but we still have lots of cars running. And as they come down, it is lap number 16, and in the lead right now. As they flash by, it looks like... Buddy Baker, I It think. is Buddy, but I'm, I'm wondering if the official score will look at in the lead. Buddy Baker is in the lead, and Richard Tenney right behind him. That's it. Buddy Baker in the lead. That's where he was before. That's where he is right now. Buddy Baker of Charlotte, North Carolina, driving one of those new 76 Fords in this race, hoping that it will have the aerodynamics. They changed it a little bit this year. He didn't think it would be as good uh, on the super speedway as perhaps the short track. No, they think that the new 76 shape is not as good as what they had before. The Mercury and the Ford, the old ones, were, of course, much sleeker at the back end. This meant that the wind got over the car much smoother way, and Buddy's really been worried whether the super speedways are going to treat the 76 Ford properly. But I think he's going to be more happy about the other events later on in the season. All right, as he comes by, we have 181 laps to go. We'll be returning to the Daytona 500 as the afternoon progresses. But for right now, this is Bill Fleming, along with Jackie Stewart and Chris Economaki, saying so long from the Daytona International Speedway, where Buddy Baker is in the lead at the present time, Ramos stops in second, and Richard Penny third. Good afternoon once again, ladies and gentlemen. This is Bill Fleming, along with Jackie Stewart and Chris Economaki, reporting live from the Daytona International Speedway for the Daytona 500. This is the 18th running of this race, and on the course right now, you're seeing Benny Parsons take the lead for the very first time this afternoon. The defending 500 champion has just passed A.J. Point for the lead. So Benny Parsons, the ex-taxi driver from Detroit, now living in Ellerby, North Carolina, has taken the lead in that number 72 Chevy, followed by the Gilmore Chevy, number 28, driven by A.J. Point. The interesting thing right now as far as strategy, with 141 laps completed and with 59 to go, is that David Pearson in the Wood Brothers Mercury is up a pit stop on the rest of the cars. Now, Cuckoo Marlin, you saw a shot of him. He's officially in third place. But again, we have to emphasize that car number 21 has one less pit stop, perhaps, to make than the others, Jackie Stewart. This could be enormously important, depending on what happens now with the yellow flags. If there are no yellow flags, this is going to help David Pearson because he's made his pit stop and he's only got one to go. This is going to be a very significant situation for him. All right, now, uh, a little bit ago, less than 15 minutes ago, we reported to you live here from the Speedway just after an accident happened involving three cars, Johnny Ray's car, Farrell Harris's car, and the pole sitter, Remo Stott. That is what they look like. Stott is on the left, 83, in the middle is Ray, and on the right is Farrell Harris. Now, the position there is the center car there, belonging to John Ray, was T-boned, as they call it down here. It was run into by car 82, which, of course, hit him fairly hard right at the driver's uh, seat, more or less. Luckily, he hasn't got serious injuries from what we've been given. There is a report from the hospital, but it's about the only sort of accident you can get down here where a driver can get seriously injured. But there we are. There's car number 72, Benny Parsons, the leader at this time. And remember, he was the leader last year, but A.J. Point's slowing it's down. A.J. Point's got trouble. He's slowing down on the back straight. A.J. Point is a troubled man right now. This is a big disappointment. He's come from the 15th row. What a sad day for him right now, Bill. A.J. Foyt started slowing down, coming out of turn two. We had the glasses on him, and it looked like it was trouble. There was no smoke from the automobile, but he went uh, down on the inside apron, and uh, currently running in second place, running neck and neck with Betty Parsons. Until that happened, 
you know, it could be that he's got a fuel gasoline problem here. It may be that AJ's got some, some trouble with gasoline. It may be that he's one shot. We don't know. He may have switched off his engine. Let's wait. He's coming into pit lane right now. He's just coasting in. It doesn't seem that he's got an engine running, but AJ's getting in there. The Gilmer crew waiting for him, obviously anticipating what's going on. He'll be shouting instructions to them right now. They're looking under the hood. They haven't bothered with a gas tank. I'm afraid it could be electrical. He had electrical troubles here earlier on in the 125 qualifier. Well, let's go down to Chris Economaki. Okay. Uh, it's a case of nobody knows what's the matter yet, Bill. The mechanics are looking. AJ has just shut the engine off. This looks like it might be the end of a fantastic day for AJ. They still have... They're putting the hood down, and that means it's all over. Let's see if we see can... See if you can get a word with him, uh, Chris. Get a word with him if, uh, Boy, he just ran a fantastic ball. race. He's going to be getting out. Uh, that was a very fast, fatal diagnosis on the engine. They're pushing the car away. When he gets out, we'll try and get with him back to you, Bill. Okay, well, it's the sad A.J. Boyd and Jim Gilmore, the car owner, and Benny Parsons now. He did not inherit the lead. Let me make a point of that. He took the lead. And then A.J. dropped back, so oh, let's say, within a half a lap. But you remember a year ago when it was David Pearson who had the lead and with two laps to go, spun out, and Parsons moved in to take the 1975 running of the 500. Well, Benny Parsons is right there where he was a year ago. Can he keep it going? There's still a lot of racing to go. 55 laps remaining in the grueling 500. Back in a moment. Car number 72, driven by Benny Parsons, is in the lead right now, but let's document the story of what could happen now. In second place is car number 14, Cuckoo Marlin, from Columbia, Tennessee. And in third place, there's the uh, second place car, and in third place is car number 21, David Pearson. The interesting thing about it is that David came in on the 129th lap. He pitted. He got tires. He got fuel. He needs only one more pit stop. However, both Benny Parsons and Cuckoo Marlin need two more pit stops, according to our figures. So that means that as soon as they come in and have to do that, it would indicate that they would uh, lose the lead to none other than the old Silver Fox himself, David Pearson. Well, I think we're going to see quite a remarkable finish in this race, so just sit in your seat, because motor racing is something of a great surprise to everyone. This is a question of uh, tactics right now, and there's no better pit in this business than the, uh, the Wood Brothers, who are famous the world over for the pit work. They've definitely done a job so far, but Benny Parsons, who's really matured as a driver, Bill, over these last 12 months since winning this big 500. This is a question of confidence in a lot of cases. Benny Parsons had been looking for a way to go for so many years in this tour, and of course, this big win brought him to the eyes of the public and made him a more confident driver. He's in there today leading the race that he won last year. This is, a, this is an important thing. There's a relationship there between your first place man and your second place Okay, man. coming into the pits now, it looks like Cuckoo Marlin is coming into the pits. Cuckoo Marlin, car number 14, uh, did a little, uh, did a little extra. Whoa, oh, he's he coming in the pits, Danny. He, he locked it up. He spun in the pits and he's gone straight in. He's going to have to engage reverse gear. I don't know what could have happened there. That was, he was having a lot of trouble there coming in. It yes, looked he like he had only rear wheel brakes there, but there's something else wrong. So, David Pearson now has officially moved into second place in the standings behind Benny Parsons. And again, keep in mind, as we watch Cuckoo Marlin's car being shoved backwards here, keep in mind that it is a pit stop that's going to come up very shortly for Benny Parsons. We want to make also a correction on the driver in car number 82. We have been informed by NASCAR that Skip Manning was driving the car in place of Farrell Harris today, a last-minute switch in drivers, and it is Manning who was involved in that three-car accident. However, he only has chin lacerations and contusions. Well, Cuckoo Marlin is being shoved backwards there, and it looks like he's going to be out of it as Benny Parsons is running in first place, car number 72, as you can see him there on the race course, and car number 21, David Pearson behind him. Richard Petty, now in car number 43, is still in contention. He was one lap down, but did unlap himself. And there is David Pearson, as we mentioned, in second place, but in good shape as far as pit stops are concerned. Jackie, I think uh, we're going to recap that three-car accident just once again. 
Well, we have the car spinning inside, going low on the racetrack, and this is where we got out of sight. It's not sure at this time whether he was T-boned and at what part of the racetrack he was T-boned. But there's 83. That car wasn't so severely damaged. That was our pole sitter, the man who had grabbed pole position, Ramos Scott. He wasn't in such bad position, but the other two cars certainly came into heavy collision. We're back again, of course, to our leader, Benny Parsons. They're high on the racetrack, and he comes through there, the man who's leading the race. All right, it's Benny Parsons, David Pearson, and Richard Petty. Richard Petty was able to move up quite a bit. He was a lap down, but when David Pearson pivoted, he had moved up on him. And car number 54, that's driven by Lenny Pond, is a lap down in fourth place. And as I mentioned, Kulu Marlin had come in, uh, did a side slide, and then uh, just did raise the pit wall until he got turned around and back out on the race course once again. At 150 laps, with 50 laps to go, it's Benny Parsons in the lead. And then David Pearson. And right behind him, you can see King Richard himself, Richard Petty. 151 laps completed. We'll be back in a moment. David Pearson from Spartanburg, South Carolina. He is now in second place, chasing Benny Parsons of LRB, North Carolina. Incidentally, the uh, money earnings are kind of interesting to know that David Pearson is second in the all-time money winnings, a million four hundred thousand dollars. One of the four millionaires in NASCAR racing. Richard Petty, who's out on the course and who has just come in a moment ago for tires and fuel. And now I think Benny Parsons is going to make his pit stop. So let's keep our eyes on him, but at the same time, keep our eyes on David Pearson out on the race course. Hey, what, Jackie? You watch uh, Parsons, and I'll look for Pearson. Well, we've got there. He's coming to a stop there. Now, his crew, of course, are a first-class crew, but they can't be expected to be quite so good as the Wood Brothers, who look after David Pearson, or, for that matter, the Petty crew. They're, of course, top-class men, but to compete against these two other teams that I mentioned is something, because they are the best in the world. You can see they're changing the outside rubber there, the tires on this side of the car. They're changing the other ones as well. There, they're getting the car ready to go. All right, and here goes David Pearson. By the front grandstand, down the straightaway, he has the lead. There goes Pearson by. So Pearson has the lead. And uh, Parsons will hang on to second place, I believe, because Richard Petty was a lap down. We'll see how they wind up on the race course itself. David Pearson kicking himself around for spinning out last year with two laps to go. He has never won this race, the Daytona 500. That's a surprising thing, isn't it? He's won the firecracker, I don't know, three or four times. He's been a grand national champion three times. But he's never won the prestigious Daytona 500, and today will be the richest stock car race in history. Approximately $350,000 in prize money, some $44,000 to the winner. And, Jackie, I don't have to tell you, it's worth at least five or six times that much in terms of the overall benefit. Well, I think so, because uh, just take an example of the man you're looking at right now, Benny Parsons. He must have enjoyed uh, an enormous amount of success over the last 12 months, and financially he must be a lot better off. So therefore, he must be happy. It's very interesting to note in the case of Benny Parsons that this place last year, he started in 32nd position on the starting grid, and he won the race. And this year, he started in the 32nd position again, and he's been leading the race. Of course, now he's in that, uh, that position of opportunity to win again, which is, you know, more than just a stroke of luck, it would seem. Well, if you're a believer in numerology, it's certainly kind of an interesting thing to contemplate. But right now, it is David Pearson in the lead. He had a pit stop on the 129th lap. If I had to project as to when a pit stop would come, it would be around 165 to 168, I would imagine, if they keep running at these speeds. In case you join us a little bit late, Bobby Allison is out of the race uh, with mechanical problems. A.J. Foyt is out of the race. Daryl Waltrip is out of the race. And uh, David Hobbs is out of the race. As I mentioned to you earlier, Buddy Baker went out, was flagged off the course. Cale Yarbrough, girl, didn't even hardly get started before his engine gave way. So we've had a lot of big names uh, go out behind pit row today. Right now, it is David Pearson in the lead, being chased by number 72, Benny Parsons. And we're looking at car number 21, David Pearson of Spartanburg, South Carolina, in the lead right now. Has one pit stop to his credit over the 
followers behind, but Benny Parsons, who had just made one now, would be even with him as far as pit stops are concerned. But uh, Benny, let's see, about half a lap behind or so. We'll check on exactly how many seconds. But right now, I think it'd be a good idea to get a report from Chris Economaki. It was a $7 valve spring that cost A.J. Foyt a chance at winning his second uh, Daytona 500. He went behind the wall with a car, and it cost Duncan Seth you $7. And so that's the amount of the part that broke. Bobby Allison is also out with mechanical trouble. And right now on the track, the same setup as, as was at this time last year. David Pearson and Benny Park. Back to you, Bill. Okay, thanks very much uh, for the report. Second place car, Benny Parsons. And David Pearson in the lead. David Pearson, incidentally, won the first race of the season on the Grand National Circuit at Riverside. Finished fourth here a year ago, as I mentioned, but spun out. Well, I'm sure that you are aware of everything that went on during this past uh, week. The sports pages literally around the world were headlining a story that three of the nation's top drivers, A.J. Floyd and Dave Marcus and Darrell Waldrop had their qualifying runs the last uh, Sunday disallowed because their cars had equipment on them that wasn't supposed to be there. NASCAR officials removed that equipment. The cars did requalify and were still the fastest. But the implication uh, was clear. An attempt to cheat had been discovered. And, of course, uh, that has been one of the main topics of conversation all week long. It's interesting to note, you know, the scrutineers and officials are spending a lot of time now checking these cars. And the car you're looking at right now, car number 21 of David Pearson, the leader, at the driver's meeting this morning, people uh, draw to see whose cars are going to be examined after the event by the officials. And David Pearson was, in fact, the man who lifted the numbers out the hat. And who did he lift out? But David Pearson. <laughs> so after this car comes to a stop at the end of this race, whether he wins or not, he's going to have to have that car more or less stripped naked by the officials to have it thoroughly checked. So there we are. He did it to himself. But of course, obviously, the degree of fair play that everyone's looking for in any sport is going to play here at Daytona this Sunday again. 161 laps have been completed. We have 39 laps to go in this grueling race of 200 laps, 500 miles. And David Pearson, who has the all-time super speedway victory record of 33, Richard Petty, believe it or not, is second with 32. Okay, for those of you who like to know where your favorites are, let's run down the cars that are out of the race. Bobby Allison is out. Walter is out. Cisco is out. Garborough is out. Buddy Baker is out of the race. A.J. Floyd is out. Walt Ballard is out. Tommy Williams is out. Mentioned Buddy Baker. Richard Brooks went out early. Incidentally, that's Farrell Harris. We want to again correct that. That was Skip Manning in that car involved in a three-car accident with the pole center, Ramo Stott, Johnny Ray, and Skip Manning. But again, the hospital report, in case you did not get it, is that Ramo Stott and Manning uh, were not seriously hurt, just a couple of uh, bruises. John Ray had a broken shoulder, a broken arm, and uh, multiple contusions, but uh, apparently nothing more than that. He did have some chest pains. The uh, field hospital confirmed, so they'll not, no doubt send him on to the regular hospital, the Halifax Hospital. And uh, a further update on that from Halifax, that he has arrived there, and uh, this is officially from NASCAR, is that uh, he is now in serious condition with chest injuries. So we regret to have to uh, say that the uh, injuries are more than just the broken shoulder and the broken arm. Richard Petty now, as you can see, running in uh, second place according to the scoreboard. We'll have to confirm that as far as pit stops are concerned. But I believe he has moved in. He was closing in on Benny Parsons a little bit earlier, and we noted was running faster. He was running 181 miles an hour, and Parsons had slowed down to about 178. Might be a good idea, too, as the afternoon wears on to take a look and see how fast David Pearson is running here. He did pit on 129. We have now completed 164 laps. 
I noticed too that Terry Ryan, who is the outside pole, first row is still in there. Car number 81 has come into the pits, but this rookie from Davenport, Iowa, is uh, still in there in fifth place. He's doing very well. He's a sort of protege of Bobby Allison's. They're very proud of him in the Allison family. The way that this young man has been coming along, and to be in the top five or top six positions in the Daytona 500 at this part of the motor race is very, very, very important. All right, let's go down to Chris Economaki. He has a report for us. Okay, Ned, it looks as though Benny, Benny Parsons may not finish this race. He has... Pearson is coming in. Chris, I don't right, know whether you can see it or not, but right, down the road from you is uh, David Pearson's car. I'm right by that car. He's coming in. His engine is smoking a little bit. He's going to have a break here. Benny Parsons in number 72 has lost the cylinder, as crew chief told me. They do not think that car can go the distance. So it's a plus for David Pearson. The crew doesn't know that as yet. And David Marcus, true, went back to the garage area, changed the cylinder head. They were out of the race for more than 60 laps. Dave Marcus is now back on the track. Back to you, Bill. All right. Uh, thank you. A 16-second pit stop. How that for the uh, Wood Brothers crew? And Pearson is back out on the race course. In second place now is Richard Petty in car number 43. David Pearson stopped on the 165th lap, so he easily should be able to run 35 laps, barring anything happening. He certainly ought to be able to do it on the field. So the man that's trying to close the gap on him, you're looking at right now, Richard Petty. We'll be back in just a moment. Bill Fleming along with Jackie Stewart and Chris Economaki back at the Daytona International Speedway. Richard Petty has the lead, but keep in mind, he made a pit stop on the 151st lap. We have now reached 168. It would be very problematic if he could go 49 laps without fuel. So Richard Petty is due to come in. However, David Pearson, car number 21, hit it on the 165th lap. He could go 35 laps on the fuel that he got. So keep in mind that even though Richard Petty has this amount of distance on the racetrack, he still will have to come in for fuel. Yeah, and it's only a matter of five or six seconds ahead of David Pearson on the racetrack, so he could never hope to do that. He's going to have to come into the pits, even if he had a very fast pit stop only for fuel. It would cost him 10 seconds, plus the slowing down time, Bill, and the accelerating time. Because when you're doing 180 odd miles an hour around this racetrack, you've got to slow down, you've got to brake, come into the pits, and you've got to accelerate out again. And that takes an awful lot of time on the racetrack. So unless a yellow flag comes in, that's not going to do him a great deal of good to be in the pits. But we'll just have to wait because motor racing, I'm afraid the air is always pregnant. <laughs> You know, David has won the July 4th Firecracker 400 at Daytona record four times. But as I said, he has never won the, this race right here, the 500, considered to be the most prestigious of all stock car races. He's currently in second place following Richard Petty, who has won it five times. Incidentally, we have a lot of distinguished visitors here today for the 500. Roger Rousseau, the president of the Montreal Olympic Games, is here as a guest. Tony Holman, the president of the Indianapolis 500, the Indianapolis Speedway, is here. He celebrated his 75th birthday on Friday night. And, of course, is looking forward to the 60th running of the Indy Classic on Memorial Day, May the 30th. And also here is the Grand Marshal of this race is Governor George Wallace of Alabama. So we have a lot of distinguished people here today and a record crowd on hand. It's absolutely ideal, perfect weather for racing. 170 laps have been completed, 30 laps to go. Things get very dicey about this time because we have to figure on pit stops. And, of course, right now, the Petty crew is wondering what to do about him. They look back on their lap charts and they realize that his last pit stop came on the 151st lap. If a yellow came out, Bill, it would have to help a great deal in the case of Richard Petty. He's sort of relying on that because then probably David Pearson would come into the pits as well. Not only would they take on fuel at that time, they would probably take on tires as well. The reason for that is that they don't wear the tires out this close to the end of the race, but they would get new tires which would be cooler and would work better on this speedway because, of course, the speedway does change a great deal. And we're going to have an interval timing right now on Richard Petty, the leader of the car. You can see in there, car number 43, you can see the clock running right now as we wait for David Pearson, who's in second position. As the clock stops on the track, it's 
1.96 seconds. Now that's not very much at all. If he does have to stop in a green light, he's in big trouble. If he stops in a yellow, he's still got a big chance of the race, Bill. All right. Uh, we might also, uh, if we can, do it, uh, a timing on the leader because if he if he goes around the two and a half miles in 50 seconds, he does exactly 180 miles an hour. So we might see just exactly how fast Richard Petty is going right now. Difficult to relate with this enormous crowd they've got, you know, record crowd. It's difficult to relate how fast these cars are going from the long shots that we're getting here. But when you consider they're averaging more than 180 miles an hour, that's enormous. One moment, we've got at least a record crowd here. We've got more than 100,000 people in beautiful weather, but with a high wind. A high wind that sometimes can make the cars a little difficult to handle, particularly coming off of the turns. Coming off of turn two, for example, and then coming off of four, where there's a big bad bump in any case. I think uh, Chris Economaki has an audio report for us from the pit area. Chris? We just talked with Richard Petty's crew chief, Dale Inman. They say that Richard will be coming in at lap 185 for a final touch of fuel, unless, of course, the yellow flag comes out sooner. Now, this final pit stop is going to be the crucial one for the crews. They can win or lose the race for their man. We ought to take a clocking on the stop flight and Eddie and Pearson when they come up. Back to you, Bill. Yeah, well, here's the important thing, Chris, as far as we're concerned. How about Pearson's crew? Do they feel that, that he has to come in at all, or is he well, home free? We've got a yellow. I'm in. I'm in. That means they'll all come in. That's just academic now. That It'll be sure a race is. to the finish if there's no more yellow flags. Back to you, Bill. Okay, and it was caused by car number 63, Terry Bivens of Shawnee Mission, Kansas. Yes, everything you just said indicated, of course, that uh, the yellow being out means that they can come in under the yellow on the 174th lap. Now the question is, strategy-wise, did it hurt or did it help? Well, it has to help uh, Richard Petty to, to have this situation come along because he's got to come into the pits in any case, and they're going at a slower pace, and I should think David Pearson will come in as well. It's a question of whether he will or he won't. It will be interesting to see what strategy the, the Wood Brothers use at this, this time. This is the absolute crux of this race this afternoon because with the yellow out right now, and it doesn't look like it'll be a very long yellow, both cars could go the remaining distance. It would be simply a sprint. And it looks right now as if it's going to be between Petty and Pearson because Betty Parsons, as Chris Economaki reported, has a sick car and cannot run fast with the leaders. And Pearson is in the pitch. Pearson coming is in. coming down the pitch and he's getting toggled up with other traffic. That can't be helping him. All right, I'm going to put a stopwatch on him. As soon as those wheels stop, we'll see how long it's going to be in the pits for David Pearson. Pearson taking advantage of this. He probably could have run the rest of the way without fuel. He's putting tires on, just as I said earlier, they're putting cool new tires on, which will give him better grip. He's putting four new tires on, getting a complete set of tires, as well as filling it up with petrol the right amount. This will be very into long pit stop, but remember, it doesn't matter too much because the yellow flag is out and they've got to stay in position in any case. So there, David Pearson goes onto the racetrack again after a very slow approach to the pit and a slow exit, but he's now prepared for the end of the race, fully equipped. 56, or was that 26 seconds it was, 26.2 seconds. And there is the leader in the familiar number 43, the Petty Dodge, 38-year-old King Richard Petty in the lead, and he is coming into the pit for fuel. And the yellow caution flag is out. We've had 27 laps under the caution and, uh, this afternoon. It came at a very opportune time. As far as Richard Petty is concerned, on the 174th lap, Pearson is in, Petty has been in, and uh, now let's go down to Chris Economaki for a report. Okay, Bill, what these Grand National crews do under this set of circumstances with 24 laps of racing remaining and no need to come back to the pit, they, in their own words, rebuild the car. They give it four new tires. They give it oil. They give it gas. They make it as racy as possible so that the drivers can race full before to the finish. The yellow flag closes up to leaders, and it should be quite a run to the checker. Back to you, Bill. I have a feeling it is going to be quite a wild finisher, as you uh, indicated this afternoon, because Penny will be right up behind David Pearson. Since Benny Parsons has come into the pit area, it means that he is wiped off as the leader. And I don't believe we're going to have too many more on the uh, laps under the yellow here, because uh, that uh, car that blew the engine just uh, came down on the apron. One more lap. We'll get a green at the end of this one. All right, gentlemen, let's do a little speculating on uh, exactly what can happen with 23 laps to go. 
That is at 50 seconds a lap, of course, just about 20 minutes to go in the race. And at the end of that, it would be $44,000 to the winner. All right, Chris, you have something else? Yeah, I've got Glenn Wood with me here. Glenn, what kind of shape is David in number 21? Well, I don't know. About as good a shape as anybody, I guess. We just changed all four tires, and I'm sure the rest of them did, too. So it'll just be a start to finish from right here. What are you thinking about right now? I don't know. You just don't think about this yet. You're all through for the day. They say that after the driver makes his last pit stop, it's up to the driver. The pit, the pit boys have done their job. You've done yours well today. Are you relaxing now? Well, no, this is not necessarily the last one for everybody. Sometimes, uh, a while ago, we got a lap down with a cut tire, so uh, you can't be sure until the checkered flag comes down. Well, I know that, but uh, uh, you've rebuilt the car. I see a sign going up. What are they signaling David now? I'm not sure. And what about the radio? Is he using a radio today? Yeah, we've been talking to him all day. Well, then why the board? Well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, Glenn, go on back to work. Glenn Wood, the crew chief on the Pure Later Mercury, driven by David Pierce. Remember, it was a year ago today that David had the lead with just a couple of laps to go. The whole thing blew up. Back to you, Bill. All right, as the cars come down, the green flag will be out. And we have 23 laps to go. Richard Penny is three car lengths behind. David Pearson. And by the way, that important message that was being given to David Pearson by his crew there was to inform him that these radio was out. The radio is obviously out of action now. They've been using it all day, as Chris just pointed out, with Glenn Wood, but now I'm afraid it's out of action. But the race you're going to see right now are between two of the finest drivers in the world at this kind of race. You know, Richard Petty and David Pearson, you just can't get anybody better than that. It's ironic to say that right at the very beginning of this show, I felt that at the end of the race, we were going to have these two men in here because it's experience not only from a driver's point of view that gets them here, but also from the crew. These people prepare cars for this kind of event, and very few people know how to win motor races. There's only maybe a handful in the world in every formula, and you're looking right now at two of those men. Well, they are two of the four millionaires in racing, stock car racing. Richard Petty has won $2,200,000 and 177 wins. Pearson has won $1,400,000 and 87 wins. Strangely enough, Pearson has a one victory lead over Petty as far as super speedways are concerned. 33 to 32. And Benny Parsons in the pitch, as you can see, he's been in several times in the last few laps. He's got trouble, but he's got an advantage on the car that's in fourth and fifth position. He's obviously wanting to finish the race. They're changing rubber on his car. But they're obviously working in the rear end of the car as well as, far as, as well as putting tires on. It seems a strange time to do it after the yellows have been out there. But these two men, I think, are going to be doing some very close racing right now, and nobody gives anything. All right, we want to get a lap timing on the leaders right now and see how fast they're actually going. Well, I guess we can't do it this time, but we do want to do it because uh, if they can do it in 50 seconds, they're cruising at 180 miles an hour. And I, I want to keep emphasizing that to you. You know, every time you're doing three miles a minute, that is just a little fast. Incidentally, I'd like to make a reminder, too, that later on today, ABC Sports will continue its exclusive coverage of the 12th Winter Olympic Games via satellite from Innsbruck, Austria. That'll be at 5.30 Eastern and Pacific Time, 4.30 Central Time, then make note at 7 o'clock Eastern and Pacific, 6 o'clock Central, and then finally our conclusion, our two-hour show at 9 o'clock Eastern and Pacific Time, 8 o'clock Central Time, which will have the closing ceremony, so be sure to join us for this still remaining full day of Olympic action brought to you exclusively here on ABC. And I personally am really going to miss this next week. Uh, it's been marvelous television for those of us who are back here home watching the Olympic Games. It's really been great. Now with 19 laps to go, 181 laps completed, there are the two men, David Pearson and Richard Petty. They have long been adversaries. David is four years older than Richard. Not quite as many victories. But they are the two top money winners of all time in NASCAR racing, and it seems fitting that in this, the richest race in NASCAR history, they are right there, less than three car lengths to push. It's ironic with all the controversy that's been going on over the last week with regards to the regulations uh, with the officials here that these two men were never part of that controversy at any time. But uh, right now, I think that's gone out of everything. There's been a lot of talk here internationally. I was speaking to Britain a little while ago, a couple of days ago, and they even read about the Daytona official problem over there. So it's been well spread around the world. 
certainly right now, with 18 laps to go, it's a very clear mind there that they're going to need in, in, in the driving seat. Okay. 18 laps to go. David Pearson leading Richard Petty. Neither one needs a fuel stop. It'll be a dash right to the finish. So don't go away. From high above the Daytona International Speedway, from the Goodyear blimp, you see a graphic picture of these cars traveling at 180 miles an hour plus as they go down that long back stretch, Lake Lloyd there on the left. This coverage coming live to you from Daytona today. We've been delighted to be here. It's been really a great week of racing, and it's climaxed by this particular day. We will be coming up to 185 laps completed with 15 laps to go as soon as they come by this time. And look how close they are. Richard Petty zeroing in on David Pearson. I, I can't imagine what that last turn is going to look like. Well, I don't know, but right now it's interesting that uh, Richard doesn't seem to be making an attempt to pass David. He seems to be quite happy to sit in there and, uh, and slipstream him and draft him all the way through without necessarily rushing back and forward. So he's just obviously holding his time because he could easily draft him at this point, just as they're coming out of turn two there and get through the main straightaway, 3,000 uh, feet in length, he could certainly get a draft from that car there and get through, but he's not doing it. He's just sitting there. I'd also like to mention that there are three other big races coming up very, very soon here on the NASCAR circuit. The Richmond 400 from Richmond, Virginia. That'll be coming up on Sunday, February the 22nd. Then uh, the always popular Carolina 500 at Rockingham, North Carolina on February the 29th, that's also on Sunday. Then moving ahead to the 14th of March, Sunday, the Southeastern 400 at Bristol, Tennessee. 14 laps to go. You know, Jackie, you were here a year ago along with Keith, and uh, you saw that race happen. You saw what was going on with uh, David Pearson and Cale Yarbrough. It was the three laps to go, and things uh, happened that uh, certainly could not have been foreseen. Well, that's what we said earlier. You know, you never know with motor racing. You just never know the moment. A man like David Pearson, with all his experience last year, was in a situation where he was in this same position Let's leading. We're going to have a look at last year to just see what happened to David Pearson a year ago. And there he is in the same car number 21. This is last year's picture just behind Kale Yarbrough coming off the banking in turn two. He goes to pass Kale without a great deal of trouble using all the road he wants to and suddenly the car veers, look at that, right, then left, then nearly hits Kale Yarbrough, spins inside the racetrack gets himself in the grass, 180 odd miles an hour, not an easy situation, could easily have overturned, and he came to a stop and he lost the Daytona 500 because of that maneuver on that back stretch. So obviously he knows that this could happen again, so he's got to be very careful. Now we're back with this footage of 76. Yes, and in the lead is Richard Petty who has taken David Pearson on the back stretch. Richard Petty is in the lead by three or four car lengths over David Pearson. He just came off that third turn and into the fourth turn and the car is smoking. We may have a yellow here. We may have a yellow if, if the engine has blown on car number... You can't see that whether it is... 95? 95, Jimmy Herdeby? No, no, it looks like... 95. Uh, yep, Jimmy Herdeby. Still green on the race course. 188 laps. And Richard Petty has taken the lead from David Pearson. You were seeing the videotape of last year's 500, and of course, to uh, complete the thought of that, it enabled Benny Parson to win last year's race. Benny had hopes of being the only the second man to win more than one Daytona 500 today, but apparently those hopes have been dashed because of mechanical problems with the car he can't run with the leaders right now, unless, of course, something should happen to those two. Well, you never know. You know, stranger things have happened. Benny Parsons sitting in third position might now. Now he's a lap down, but obviously still third is a good situation. It's interesting. You know, it's a cat and mouse job between Petty and Pearson because, you know, Petty could have passed earlier, but he didn't. Maybe David Pearson just lifted off that little bit to let Richard Petty through because he wants to have a look behind to see where he can best take advantage of that car of, of, of Petty. Now, drafting is very important. And these are two different cars. The Dodge that you're looking at now, the 43 car, maybe is a little bit cleaner than the Pearson car, the 76 Mercury that he's running. Okay, they feel that that new uh, confirmation of Mercury of the Ford this year will be good on the shorter tracks too, but it's doing very well right here, I'll tell you. 
Bill Fleming along with Jackie Stewart and Chris Akanamaki. Nine laps to go. Richard Petty in the lead. David Pearson right behind him. Those are the two cars right now that are on the same lap. The only two cars on the same lap in this race. Now third place is Benny Parsons, but he is one lap down. Now the thing that occurs to me, Jackie, you being a former world driving champion, have to know what's going on in those cars. It looks easy you know, to go around the course for 191 laps, but the fatigue factor has to be tremendous. Well, there is fatigue, not only in the motor car, but in the driver. And you have to remember, in this particular case, Richard Petty, the man that's leading this race night, right now, was in hospital. He had a peptic ulcer. He was in hospital for about between 6 and 12 days. And, of course, he just got out of that two weeks ago. Now, he can't be just as strong as he was, for example, last year at this time. And he said that earlier to Chris Economaki. So therefore, a man who's not quite so fit, it's a long way. 500 miles is very tiring. A racing driver, I know in Grand Prix motor racing, we lost about five or six pounds in weight during a race, not only due to the heat inside the car, but the nervous energy you burn up. And of course, a driver at that time begins to imagine things a little bit. You sit in that car, as these two drivers right now are doing, you feel a little strange vibrations, things that perhaps you've just began to notice because you become a little tired or you're looking for things. You're a worrier, you're a pessimist. And if you've got an ulcer, maybe you're a bigger worrier. So, <laughs> Richard Petty right now is maybe <laughs> having, a, having a kitten in there. Uh, that's the kind of thing that, uh, Jackie, we, we really enjoy hearing from you because nobody knows it better than the man who has been in the cockpit and knows exactly what goes on. And also had an ulcer awesome driving racing car. Did you carry a little bottle of milk in there? <laughs> oh, no, we never did get around to that. But, you know, they sometimes do have a drink in these stock cars. In the summer season, when it gets very, very hot, they, they do take refreshments. Seven laps to go. Richard Petty in the lead. And, of course, followed by David Pearson. And just as a question now, I'm sweating it out for these final seven laps, six and a half to be exact at this point. I don't know whether uh, Chris Economaki has anything to report. If you do, Chris, if you uh, come across anything down there involving either Richard or David, by bring us up to date. Otherwise, we'll just watch them go around and see what happens as they come off the final turn on the last pass. I might mention to you that next weekend, ABC Sports will be bringing you the Glen Campbell Los Angeles Open Golf Tournament live from the Riviera Country Club in Los Angeles. We begin our coverage on Saturday at 6 o'clock Eastern Time and on Sunday at 5.30 Eastern Time. Prize money, $185,000. First prize, $37,000. And the players like Jack Nicholas and Johnny Miller, Lee Provino, and of course the defending champion, red-haired Pat Fitzsimons. What a victory he had there a year ago. So be sure to join us for the Glen Campbell Los Angeles Open next weekend over most of these ABC stations. Chris, do you have a word? Okay, all of the hardened veterans of Pit Road, the callous ones that never watched the race, are out on the wall now, waiting to see what's going to happen between Richard Petty and David Pearson. A few years ago in July, a spectacular finish erupted between these two. Every person to a man has dropped what they're doing down here to watch the outcome of this 18th annual Daytona 500. The spectators and the pit crews have suddenly become spectators now. Back to you, Bill. Okay, that's a very good observation, Chris, because most of the time, they can't see much from down there, but what they're really seeing now are two of the great nights of NASCAR racing jousting right down to the final. It really has boiled down to just that. Two cars, and there they are. They're on your screen with five laps to go. And it's really only going to be in the last three laps, Phil, that they're going to choose where to position themselves because they've been around this racetrack so many times, they've been rushing for the flag so many times that they almost know which mark on the road to really stand on it and really get onto the right part of the racetrack. Remember, both of those drivers are going round this racetrack flat to the floor of the accelerator all of the time. They're never off it. So therefore, it's not a question of standing on it. It's a question of where you are on the racetrack, where to pick up the draft, and where to take it from there. And my goodness, when you've got two old foxes like they are, there's nothing much to choose from. All right, as uh, we look at them, we see Benny Parsons in car number 72. He's the third place car, and he is a lap down. Then let's got to the side of Lenny Pond, who is the fourth place car, two laps down, and a young fellow by the name of Neil Bonnet, car number 12. He's just a rookie, comes from Hueytown, Alabama. He could very well wind up in fifth place and pretty good money there for a rookie. There's no 
not many people walking away from the speedway right now. You know, when you get to the closing laps of a motor race, normally you see the people trying to get out just before the end, before the, the crowd start to get out. But I haven't seen one person move from the seat so far. They want to see the show. And what a show we have seen here today. A lot of the favorites did go out. Bobby Allison went out. Cale Yarborough went out very early. A.J. Foyt went out of the race. Darrell Waltrip, one of the young chargers, was out of the race. Uh, after making a good run at the thing. But right now, there they are, two men. And they've completed 197 laps. Okay, when they come by here, they will be on the 199th lap. 198 completed. So the next time around, we will have the checkered, I mean, not the checkered, the white flag before the checkered. One lap to go. And it's as if a motor race was just starting all over again. The adrenaline's pumping right inside those motor cars. The driver is as excited now as he was before they asked, gentlemen, start your engine. And right now, both of them are thinking the same thing. Now, what does he choose to do? Does Richard Petty choose to leap going down the back straight on that last important lap? Or does he fall back and let David Pearson do it? Does he feel confident that that car, that Dodge, will take him all the way through turn three and four without being threatened by Pearson on the draft up to the dogleg finish? That's where confidence comes in, and we'll just have to wait and see. Johnny Bruner Sr. Uh, has always told the drivers, white flag is out, one lap to go, keep your eye on the rear vision mirror. He said it's extremely important. I don't believe that you have to tell Richard Petty to keep his eyes in the rear vision mirror. I reckon he's throwing it out the window right now. I don't think he's even interested. But there they go when they're coming Everybody the is Back standing stretch. here at the Daytona International Speedway. Look at David Pearson. He has moved closer. Can he do it? He's going to pull out now. He's going to try for the track. I don't know. He's down on the inside. He's, he's even. He's got the lead, but there's a car ahead of him. There is a slower car ahead of him. And Richard Petty and Pearson go high. Pearson now has the lead. Petty tries to go back down on the inside as they come out of the fourth turn. They only have about 750 yards to go. Oh! oh it's an extra combination right away. They did hit. Oh. Petty smashes into the wall. Will he come across the start finish line? He's going to win the race. He's going to win it spinning as he, I believe, will take the checkered flag. No, he did not make it. He, he is less than 100 yards from it. Here comes Pearson. Pearson is going to try to make it across the finish line. Teddy has his car going. Pearson's going to win it. Oh, Bash and Rainbow, he wins the race. What a finish for a motorcycle. I've never seen anything like that. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable because here is Richard Petty, not more than maybe 150 feet from it. He's got it started up, and he's crossed the finishing line as well. He did it. He beat... He beat Betty Parsons across, so he gets second place. But well, he's been pushed. There may be an infringement ah, of right. the regulations there. He's Good. been pushed. So it'll be interesting to see what the officials have to say about this. But what a spectacular finish. We'll have to look at that finish again because it really was a question of Richard Petty and David Pearson really moving in on each other there in the most spectacular manner in the last corner of the racetrack. It looked actually like a demolition derby. It looked as if... The car that kept it moving was going to win it, and that's exactly what happened. Well, Chris, I don't know whether you saw it or not, but if you didn't, you really missed it. Rob, what Richard's getting out of his car? He's, their boys are unhooking him. He looks all right. Are you all right, Richard? What happened? Rob, uh, but, yeah. Uh, Let's face the camera on the road, Richard. They went around me, and, uh, and, and he went off, and I drove on in under him when I did. The front end broke loose and got him sideways. Uh, okay, Richard Petty walking away from his own words. We're going now to fix your lane and try and talk with the winner. Petty is all right physically. He Look didn't it. even seem mad, Bill. No, but... Just as a matter of fact, Lee, I don't uh, think uh, David Pearson can even see that hood is uh, wrinkled up in front of him there. That's got to be the most mangled car, Chris, that you'll ever see in Victory Lane. Well, we'll be there in a few minutes, Bill, and we'll have a chat done with David Pearson. Back to you. All right, let's take a look at it again. As they came off that final turn, we had told you stay with us. Here it is. Okay, Richard Petty in the car on the lower part there. He comes through at turn four. It was a late, and look at the car sliding. The smoke, the tire smoke's coming off. And it seems that he slid in there to David Pearson. He slides across them. Then he tries to correct. And it looks just at this moment as if he's got it corrected. 
David Pierce's car slams right in to the wall, very hard as you can see. Then Richard Petty starts to go loose again. The tail end is out. He overcorrects the car, and it too goes straight into that wall there. An accident that could almost be described as a motorcycle, a tank slapping accident. The car goes one way, one minute, and then another. He keeps the car spinning, hoping to get it across the finishing line. David Pearson runs into another car on pit lane as he comes across there. And you can see the car of Richard Petty, now in the centre of your picture, still coming to the infield. If he had slid for about another hundred feet, he would have managed to cross that finishing line. And there's the live picture of the smash car coming down, Bill. All right, and uh, Petty just leaned in David's window, and I'll bet that he probably said, uh, David, I'm sorry, doggone it. It was my fault. I was in front of you. But what a finish to that race. And, of course, the real excitement was when both cars were down on the infield. Uh, Pearson was about, I would say, 200 feet from the finish line, maybe Petty 100 feet. Petty couldn't get his car going. But Pearson could get his going. He limped across. And he won the race. Chris, you're down there. Hello. Go ahead, Chris. Okay, well, I've never seen one like this. The, the <laughs> first place, the second place car, so badly damaged. David is still in the car. He's getting out now, and we hope to be able to get a word with him. He moves his helmet. He's just like Petty, very unconcerned and very orderly. He's putting his goggles back up on the mirror, uh, just as well as a regular ride. Hey, David, what, you guys are really in show business. What a finish. What actually happened up there? Well, Chris, I drafted by him going down the back stretch, and uh, naturally, I guess if his car got to pushing or something, and he just pushed right on up into him, and naturally hit me and spun me around. And, uh, what did I got he say to him? And, what did he course, say he to him? To and stopped before he got across the finish line, and I cranked back up and kept going. Well, you know, I talked with Richard. He didn't sound mad at all or upset. He just explained it much like you did. There's no hard feelings here, is there? No, because uh, I really don't think he meant to do it. I really don't. Because, uh, uh, of course, you know, he was trying to win the race just like I was. And, uh, of course, my car was pushing, too. I was running so hard. And, uh, naturally, when I got in front of him, he didn't push that much worse. So he just pushed right into me. Okay, back to the normal victory lane interview, David. You're the first man to win a second Daytona 500 outside of Richard Petty. And our congratulations to you. As aside from the finish, can you think about what it means? Well, it means a lot to me, uh, Chris, because I've been trying so long to win this race. And I uh, just could never be able to do it. And so I told him on the radio uh, right before things started, I said, what am I going to do with this boy on my tail? Because I knew good well he was going to stay there. But he made a mistake and uh, passed me. And so that's what I wanted him to do. You had a great drive. We know everybody's happy. And congratulations again. David Pearson, the winner of the 18th Annual Daytona 500 in one of the most spectacular finishes any auto race has ever had. Back okay, now the know. reason that David was a little confused there, Chris, and what you said was that, you know, he did not win last year, although, you know, it looked like he was going to win it. This is the first time that he has ever won this race. So it is an extremely important win to him. He's won everything else in sight, including four times for the Firecracker 400. Here it is again. This is what happened when Petty cut in front, Pearson went down, just did nick another car. Now, this is where it was critical. This is where Richard Petty is less than 100 feet from the finish line. He couldn't get it going. That's right. His engine was stalled, and it may be that David Pearson's engine never did stall because you can see David Pearson coming from the grass there and, and crossing the that line, and there's the checkered flag for him. So it could be that while he was spinning, he kept his engine running, which is a good trick for a race driver. Now, you can see these crewmen pushing Richard Petty's car. Now, this is an infringement of the regulations. He was getting outside help, and he could do with a little outside help from there, but, in fact, he's getting pushed across the finishing line. It'll be interesting to see what the final results will be on that. Okay, and as you can see, nobody has left. Everybody is still standing, trying to soak up that last almost uh, impossible moment in automobile racing. So David Pearson wins his first Daytona 500 with it, $44,000, and in all... One of the most unusual and exciting finishes ever in the history of NASCAR Grand National Racing. We'll be back in just a moment. David Pearson in victory lane, the average speed 152.181 miles per hour. All in all, a great afternoon. The blimp provided by the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. This is Bill Fleming along with Chris Economaki and Jackie Stewart saying so long from the Daytona International Speedway. Travel arrangements made through and a promotion will be paid by United Airlines. Now's the time to save with United's new Freedom Fair. Any day, almost anywhere. United's new Freedom Fair. And once again, the winner of the Daytona 500 in spectacular fashion is David Pearson. This has been a presentation of ABC Sports, recognized around the world as the leader in sports television.